Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. As uh, many of you know, I had the opportunity about, uh, well, a few weeks ago to go back to Bolivia uh, to work on the uh, Ruth Graham Bell uh, Riverboat. Just a uh, few words about Bolivia uh, in general. Uh, politically, uh, there is some instability. Unfortunately, it uh, has chosen to align itself more with uh, countries such as Cuba and Venezuela. Uh, the current president uh, has been in office a while. They do have term limits, and he has chosen to try to get around those. Uh, there's a large indigenous population of people there, and they tend to be in conflict somewhat with the uh, more Spanish descendants. Uh, so there's some uh, prejudice there that uh, tends to come up. Uh, financially, the uh, country had the dubious reputation of being the poorest country in South America. Uh, recently, they've been bumped out of that position by uh, Paraguay. Uh, unfortunately, some of that has come from uh, the influx of money from the cocaine industry. Uh, they grow a lot of coca there. Uh, religiously, it, there's a strong Catholic background. Uh, on the good side of that, there is a basis of religious knowledge there. They tend to know who God is and a little about Christ. Unfortunately, they t the people we talk to tend to lack an understanding of really the finished work of Christ and true salvation. What I did is I worked on the riverboat. Uh, it's... Uh, run by Samaritan's Purse. The upper part of the boat is more sleeping quarters. The lower part, uh, in the front, there's a full dental office, and then behind that, a medical office, and then a large conference room uh, where meetings can be held and uh, you can do triage and treat some patients there as well. Uh, the people's boats were a little smaller. This is kind of a busy slide, but it basically shows uh, our trip. We started from Trinidad, and then you go uh, down some of the tributaries of the Amazon, uh, deeper into the uh, back country. The, they had had a lot of rain there. I know we've had a lot of rain here, and they had also. Uh, the good side of that is that we were able to get a lot further up than we had ever been before. This is actually a floodplain. Uh, this is a place in the dry season where there's grass and they can actually have uh, grass fires. Uh, but it was flooded when we were there and we were able to get way up into the Emosi River and some of the places where the boat had not been able to travel in the past. Uh, I did obviously mostly medical work. Uh, I was able to do some procedures Probably one of the more interesting cases was a little 
seven year old girl who came in with fever and just shoulder pain and when we got to check and she had a huge abscess in her back so we were able to get that drained and get her on some antibiotics so I did some procedures and then but a lot of it was more uh, aches and pains of people who work real hard uh, we did manage to uh, open up the ears of a of a nun at the Catholic school because it was full of wax it's not quite miraculous but she was very grateful Uh, that's more of the triage. Uh, the dentist, I'm always a little jealous of the dentist. They had two actually Bolivian dentists there and the dentist can actually fix things for the most part. So uh, they did a lot, probably more work than I did. They even had a lady who made dentures right there on the boat. I thought that was fascinating. You know, when I went, I wanted to do some more educational type work and uh, God allowed me to do that. I was able to speak in some of the villages uh, a couple of the villages, uh, and then in also in a Catholic school there, and just some education on clean water and uh, vaccinations, encouraging that and things uh, such as that to try to have more of a long-term impact on the people's health. You go back. There was uh, one nice things we were able to get into a Catholic school. It's one that they didn't let us in in previous times, uh, but the nuns were very receptive to us and we were able to get in and uh, had a young lady share the gospel with the student body and we were also able to give out a uh, Bible in all the students' hands. This is Phil Kitterson. Uh, he was running the boat and just one interesting story of uh, just the way God works out details. I was at a conference about a week or two before I went on this trip and I talked to a lady who was a representative of a company who made water filters and there mostly were for hikers and people like that but then she mentioned well we've got this project where we're making water filters in uh, for Ethiopia and trying to provide clean water for the people. And what they had was you would take a five-gallon bucket, kind of like you get at Home Depot, and you could drill a hole in it and put the water filter on there, and it would produce about five gallons of clean water in about 30 minutes. So I called the lady after the conference and said, I'm going to Bolivia. I'd really like to take some of these with us. So I went home, some emails passed, and by the time it all was done, we had about three or four days left and the company overnighted me three filters. Uh, so I was very grateful for that. On the other side of the equator, Phil was trying to get clean water on his boat and the water is just muddy, it's turbid. But he had rigged up a place on top of the boat and he was using algum to settle all the sediment and he had already produced clean water, clear water for the boat but he was afraid to drink it because you know, he was putting a little chlorine in it, but he wasn't sure of his uh, amounts. And I took the filters and he was excited. We were able to take his clear water, put it through the filters that I bought, brought and produce potable water for the boat. So I was excited about that. Uh, he also had two left and hopefully he can start to use those maybe with some of the people uh, along the river. So uh, God works out the details. I'm grateful for all that y'all did, all the prayers, uh, all the support. Uh, it uh, made for a good trip. Uh, let me pray for us. Holy Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you uh, for your work here and abroad. Uh, just pray that you would bless Bolivia, that you would uh, work for stability, that you would work to bring salvation to many, uh, that you would work to be honored in that country. Bless our service, Father, and may we worship you in spirit and in truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to worship together.
we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. God, we thank you for the love that you have for us so much more, God, than we could even imagine. We thank you for the love that our church has for, um, for your mission, God. We know that we've got people in Carlisle right now. We've um, got people that have just returned from Oaxaca. Thank you for um, just the way that we, we look to go. God, we thank you for uh, 
our look here at home as well, God. We're uh, looking forward to the missions that we have through the summer here in Pulaski. We just pray, God, that you would bless each and every effort that we put forth to bring awareness to you, uh, to others. Right now, God, as we, uh, we take this time to worship you through giving of our tithes and our offerings, we just ask, God, that you bless it, continue to bless it, to move your kingdom through our hands and our feet. May we go as you have commanded us to. Just move, uh, Lord, just with freedom in this worship service today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes it gets lost on us that the songs we sing on Sunday morning are really prayers. Um, and that, the one that Miss Beth just played, Be Thou My Vision, is a great prayer that the Lord would inspire us today. I, I trust that He has already been working in your heart and life and mind as He has mine, uh, bringing comfort and direction and conviction and all these things even thus far in the service. We've, over the last couple of years, asked ourselves some questions sort of routinely and I'll tease those back out this morning. With whom did you share the gospel this past week? Dr. Beasley and then Kendall, when he prayed, mentioned that we are people of mission. And our mission is to make disciples, teaching them all that Christ commanded. And he said he's with us. But with whom did we share the gospel, the good news of Jesus this past week? Some of us might struggle with that on a number of levels, but you can't share it if you don't know it. And there are many ways to talk about what the good news of Jesus is, but here is a way to talk about it. The gospel has to do, first of all, with bad news, that we are sinners, that have fallen short of the perfection that God requires in his very nature. We are dirty, and we cannot expect to be in the presence of of a completely clean and perfect holy God in eternity unless we become clean. So sin is the first part. Sin represents our rebellion against God, our shortcomings, that we've fallen short of his glory. Then the A, atonement, that's sort of the biggest, that's a word we all sort of need to be familiar with. That just means that Jesus, and we'll get to this in the passage today, Jesus took on our flesh lived a perfect life, died for our sins, and rose having paid for those sins from the grave. So atonement means Jesus' death and resurrection having paid for that sin. So the bad news is there were sinners. The good news is Jesus died for those sins and rose from the dead. But that's not the last part of the gospel. The last part of the gospel is the F, and it's faith that we have to exercise our personal trust in that truth for our sin to be saved. Have you done that? Have you committed your hope of all eternity in the finished work of Jesus? Consciously, willfully, volitionally, personally, not just saying, well, I've been reading the Bible since I was younger, or my family's been in this church forever, or whatever that is. Have you personally made a decision to ask forgiveness for your sin, to repent from your sin, and turn in faith to Christ? That's what the F means, belief or trust, and we'll, we'll get to another way the Lord shared it today. And then the E is, is just so we can spell safe, but we, it helps us think of eternal life. <laughs> it helps us think eternal life. That's not part of the gospel, but that's what we get. <clears throat> because the gospel, we're sinners, Christ died, we must believe, that's the gospel. E is the overflow or the result of what happens when we do that. We receive eternal life. And eternal life begins the moment we trust Christ for our salvation which begins to move into something else I'd like to highlight in a second. So, with whom did we share the gospel this week? Share it however you want to share it. Share it through your personal experience. Share it through your story of how you came to know that you're a sinner. What it looked like. Who talked to you? Who helped you understand? What passage of Scripture you were reading? You can do the Romans road. You can do, I find myself drawing a bridge a lot, the cross being the bridge over the chasm that separates between us from, that separates us from God. There are all kinds of ways we can share this. 
<clears throat> so share it. And all of us in this room, hopefully, at least know it now with clarity enough to share it. The good news is not just that First Baptist has a lot of cool things going on or that we're excited about what we're doing in the community. That's not the gospel. That's not the good news. The good news is that Jesus died for our sin and that through faith in him, we can be saved. That's the good news. So we need to be sharing that. The second question is, who have you invited to church recently? Who have you invited to church recently? If you're a little bit newer to the church family, you may not know this, but there's a little bit, not a lot. There's, there's enough that we're whispering. We're not grumbling and grinding teeth about it yet, but there's whispering going on in the church because beginning next week, our service times are changing for the next two months. And this, this change is not well received by all of us. Okay? And we understand, we understand that. But I want you to look around in this room right now at how many empty seats are in this sanctuary and in the balcony. And I'm gonna tell you, if you stick around second service, we could probably fit everybody in second service in about two thirds of this area right here. So the reason that we're doing it <clears throat> is very practical in nature. It's because the musicians that lead us and serve, the security teams and all these people, um, and the summer vacation schedules and people moving and changing and all this sort of stuff, it just makes it very difficult to staff two services. And quite frankly, there are benefits for us with us getting together with the second service people and all this sort of stuff. And can, I, can I just be just kind of plain and say, if we had so many people that we needed three services on Sunday and one on Saturday night, we would be thrilled. We would be absolutely thrilled as a church family that we needed four services a weekend. This is not in any way, and we talked about this a couple of Wednesday nights ago as a church family and voted on this as a church family, but this is not in any way an effort for us as a church to make your life difficult or to skirt work. It has nothing to do with that. It's very practical in nature. That's why we're doing it. It just seems wise. And by the way, next, next week too, the air conditioner might be up a, a notch or two, a little warmer in here because summer, short sleeves, summer dresses, all of that, it might be a little bit different. But this, who have we invited? So sharing the gospel and inviting to church, part of the reason that we as a church family have space, which is good, guests need space to fit into, is because each of us in our own lives, in our own relationships, in our neighborhoods, and in our families, we are not inviting people to come to church with us. We are not inviting people into a relationship with Christ as we have one. People are saying that the church in the United States is dying. Okay, that's a lie. The church will never die. Are we as God's people participating in his work in the United States? That's a whole nother question. This church could die. There was a time in the late 60s and early 70s where the mentality of church was to have a show or a program or energy that drew people to the church. And there's value in having things well put together. And, and you may not know it, but we try really hard, okay? <laughs> we try really hard so that when we get here, we can worship the Lord. And things are excellent, things are efficient, and people are friendly, and signage, and all that. We, we try, okay? But at the end of the day, what builds the church is people receiving the good news of Jesus that we're telling them, and then us walking with them as they grow in him, and then we all keep sharing. So why are there not more people in this church building, we are the church, in this church building? is because each of us could be sharing more. 
So if, we, if we're disgruntled about the fact that we're moving to one service for two months and before the Lord, I'm telling you, if we have an influx of people, the Holy Spirit brings revival, we will go right back to two or three or four services next week, even though we, never only, we only had one. And we'll switch middle of the week and go to four services next Sunday. If, we, if things get too crowded in here, we will switch back to two services in June. This, we're just trying to be wise and, and prudent in how we do this. But the last question that we might add for now, are you engaged in a discipleship relationship? So if we're introducing people to Christ, inviting them as we have, we assume, trust him for our salvation, are we now walking with them? Are we growing? And so this discipleship relationship basically means are we leading, facilitating a disciple, growing? Or are we the disciple who's growing under someone else's tutelage, if you will? So these questions kind of become a springboard for us today as we think about what we're about here on planet Earth, <clears throat> but also what we're about here as a church family. Our time in God's Word today is going to be centered around John chapter 6. John chapter 6. If you uh, need to use the pew Bibles there and it's shorter than the hymnals, it's page 690. If it's the same height as the hymnals, it's 982. So we're in John chapter 6. I'm just going to skim the first big parts of the chapter because we're actually going to land at the end of the chapter here. But John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, you'll see after Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, a huge crowd was following and all this sort of stuff. And you see in my Bible, it says the paragraph says the fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000. So if you don't know the story, you can kind of skim it there. But, but basically, Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people or more, depending on how you count it. So 5,000 are fed. The fourth sign, I'll explain that a little bit more in just a second. Okay, then you get down to verse 16 in that very famous account of Jesus walking on the water and saying, don't be afraid, it is I, as he's walking toward them in the storm. So now you have Jesus feeding 5,000 people, and then you have him walking on water. That's pretty cool stuff. That, hasn't ha that didn't happen to me last week. Did it happen to you? Did you all see that? didn't happen to me. In the book of John... There are two very important sevens. The first seven are the seven signs, the seven major miraculous works of Jesus, where, and this, these are the fourth and fifth of those. Then there are another seven that are important as well, the seven I am's of John, where Jesus is telling us and revealing to us who he is, and actually the first of those is, is in the passage that we'll get to in a second. But these seven signs and these seven I am's are given through the life of Christ. And they're, then they're, they're, they're recorded by a work of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John for us to be considering. So Jesus lived it. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote about it. And what we're supposed to see in this Gospel of John, we're told, and you don't need to turn there, in the, you know, near, toward the end of the book, these are written so you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing may have life in his name. So what we're supposed to see when Jesus does these seven signs and makes these seven I am statements is he is the Son of God who came from heaven to deliver his people. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the deliverer. He's come for us. That's what we're supposed to see. But, as these things kind of often go, we don't quite get it sometimes. If you look at verse 22, it says, The next day, this is after he walked on water and all that, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea knew there had been only one boat. They also knew Jesus had not boarded the boat. He was doing things they didn't understand with his disciples. But his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord gave thanks. And when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Notice what Jesus says. I assure you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs, 
What were the signs for again? To show them that he was the son of God. Not because you saw the signs of who I am. That's not why you're looking for me. Your question is not coming from a spiritually hungry place. Your question is coming not from the spiritual mindset of your condition before the living God. Your question is coming from the material mindset about what's in it for you. He says, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs of who I am, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. You're yanking on my robe strings here, trying to get me to fill your belly. Are we ever guilty of that? Are we ever guilty of praying a prayer or reading our Bible or coming to church or doing something, hoping that, you know, okay, Lord, I've kind of done something for you. It's your turn to do something for me about this job or about my health or about this or about that or about whatever. I mean, I've done my part. Isn't it your turn to do your part, kind of these material blessings? Notice what Jesus says in verse 27. Don't work for the food that perishes. Why are you so concerned about the things of this world? Why are you so driven? Why is your mind so focused on these things for yourselves? Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life. Your mindset is all wrong. You're coming at this from the outside in instead of the inside out. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. So Jesus is reminding them, look, I fed you this bread to show you who I am. That's the bigger issue. Yes, you're hungry. You know, yes, you might be amazed if you heard I walked on water, but those things, those manifestations of my power were so that you could receive me for who I am. So here, their motivation for seeking him is questioned. Why are you seeking me? And our motivation is also questioned. Why are we seeking him? Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it to get stuff or is it just to worship? to respond to his truth and love. Each of us has to answer that for ourselves. Have you ever had anyone pretend to care about you and then later you realize they were just using you? Like a friend in, let's say, school, elementary school or high school or something. Somebody gets really chummy that hasn't been really chummy with you before. And then they say, oh, by the way, we've got that big test coming up in a week, and I'm really kind of behind, and do you mind if I look at your notes? You think, oh, I thought we had something here. We don't have anything in here. You're using me. Or somebody that asks you over, or they ask you on some vacation or something that they're taking or whatever, and then they say, hey, I heard you all had a job opening at the such and such and such and such. And you just think, wow, what in the world? You don't really care about me. You're just using me for your own advantage. How did that make you feel? Pretty lousy, for lack of a better word, I I imagine. But do we ever do that to the Lord? Do Do we ever just try to manipulate him, kind of force his hand somehow? You know, we get angry with him or we treat him really nicely and, you know, all that. Well, that's what these people were doing here with Christ. They were just kind of using him to get ahead. And their mindset was all wrong. And sometimes ours can be as well. Look at verse 28. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. And in their mindset the works of God entering into the kingdom paradigm, the messianic kingdom arriving, all that. What can we do? Look, essentially, basically, Christianity, biblical Christianity, is the only religion in the world that says it's mostly about what he's done for us that matters. Every other religious system in the world says it's what we do for him that matters, whoever him or it or they are. 
So we're responding to what he has done. It's not that we're trying to do a bunch of good things so that when we step off into eternity, he'll accept us. That's not biblical Christianity. And they're saying, what can we do to perform these works of God? What must we do to be kingdom people? How do we, how do we kind of get in the club? And notice what Jesus says. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. That's it. It starts right there. Believe in me. That I left my glory in heaven to come here for you. I lived the life you could not live. He was headed to the cross. He would die and rise. Believe in me. That's, that's what you need to do to enter into the kingdom. That's what you need to do to be God's child. That's what you need to do to be adopted into his family. Believe him, rely on him, trust in him, that kind of thing. Believe in the one he has sent. Skip down to verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And so he says, believe in me, and then he says, I'm the bread of life. You, you've been talking about this physical food, but I'm what you really need. I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Maybe physically, but that's not what he's talking about. And here's, they're going to start getting confused. So he's saying, look, your deepest need is not physical, it's spiritual, and I am the spiritual bread for you. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry or thirsty. Verse 36, but as I told you, you've seen me, yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. This is a great comfort to me personally. Uh, God's promise here through the lips of his son. Everyone the Father gives me will come, and the one who does come to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, not to live for, you know, for myself or whatever, but for the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this will, is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I will raise him up. I will raise her up on that last day. Woo! Makes you want to get Pentecostal right there. That's good stuff. Absolutely. I am the bread of life. And this is the first I am in the book of John. I'm the bread of life. I meet your deepest hunger. I, I satisfy that hunger. I meet your deepest need. I am the bread of life. This is the will of my Father, we read, that everyone who sees the Son and believes may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. So, are you comfortable with that? Have you seen the Son even this morning and trusted him, believed in him, and have eternal life, looking forward to your personal resurrection? Look down to verses 56 and 57. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Okay. Within the longer tradition of Christianity, and this is, I grew up, I, I came to faith in a Southern Baptist church in East Tennessee. I did not even, I did not even understand, I had never heard really the words put together Roman Catholic Church. I, I didn't know what that meant. Okay? The truth of it is, the Catholic, which means global church, is the trunk, if you will, that, that our branches are connected to in the longer history of the church. The Roman Catholic Church that began in around 300 AD when Constantine ex supposedly accepted Christ and made it the official Roman religion, then became the combination of church and state and then things got kind of squirrely, okay? But within the Roman Catholic tradition, which we don't accept, um, they believe that this passage teaches eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ is a means of grace by which we become sanctified, physically sanctified. They have a sacramental view of atonement. Atonement should be a familiar word. 
to us this morning. They have a sacramental view of atonement that says when we appropriate through confession, through confirmation, through these things, and through, through the Mass, what happens is called transubstantiation. It mystically becomes the body and blood of Christ and physically purifies us in a kind of a mystical way. That's what they believe. So is that what Jesus is teaching here? The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, blah, blah. Is that what he's teaching? He just said, I am the bread of life. Remember? It's the first I am statement. So if he says, I am the bread of life, and then he said, he who eats me, what does he mean? What does he mean? Receives the truth into him or herself. The one who embraces this truth. We, we read the slide right before this. And this is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life. That's the point. Is if Jesus is the bread of life, we eat Him, metaphorically speaking, by we're believing in Him, if you will. Verse 57, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me, believes in me, receives this truth into him or herself, will live because of me, because of my life, my power over sin and death, my perfection, my resurrection. You will receive eternal life if you receive me. That's the faith part of the safe gospel-sharing model. Then verse 58, this is, the bread of, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Whoa, whoa, hey. <laughs> what do you think they're thinking? Bread that came down from heaven, manna in the wilderness. What's Jesus saying? I'm the bread of life who came from heaven. Whoa, he is really scrambling their categories here. It is not like the manna your fathers ate and they died. The one who eats this bread, who believes in me, will live forever. And he was teaching this in the synagogue. And he was not making friends and influencing people immediately right there. So their motivation had been questioned. And now their motivation was essentially going to be revealed. Look in verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples, the followers, the people, you know, listening to his teaching heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? It doesn't make sense that, well, first of all, if you were saying you came down from heaven, we're going to dismiss that part. But the other part was you said that if we eat your flesh and drink your blood, that doesn't make sense. It's hard. Who can accept it? They weren't understanding. Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, does this offend you? Are you stumbling over this? Do you have a problem with this? If you're having a problem with this, you're missing the point. It's not about eat, eating my physical flesh, but it is about that I came down from heaven. I'm the Son of God. I am the Messiah. If you're having trouble believing that I came down, can you believe that I'm going to go back up Verse 62, then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? If you don't yet believe that I came down from heaven as heavenly manna, the bread of life, can you believe that I will ascend back to heaven? If you're already struggling, you're not going to be able to accept that, he's saying. Verse 63, the Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. It's a, it's a work of God. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. If you will receive them, the spirit will energize this and give you life. But there are some who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and the one, Judas, who would betray him. It's pretty powerful. He knows which of us are going to accept or deny him as well. Verse 65, he said, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. Because it's a spiritual work. It's supernatural that God is doing and energizing. If we receive him, we can receive life. If we reject him, we don't. Look at verse 66. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So this is their motivation revealed. It was questioned, and now it's revealed. So now Jesus is saying, look, if you don't accept the fact that I am the bread of life, you're not my disciple. 
if, if, you're not, if you're not willing to hang in there with me and dig into the hard truths here as well, I mean, how, how hard would it have been for them to say, Jesus, what do you mean by eat your flesh and drink your blood? And I think this tendency happens for some of us sometimes too. We get into the hard teachings of Scripture and, and we just check out instead of digging in and getting answers. There, there is a truth that the deeper things of, of Scripture, like uh, of, of God's character and this whole idea of those who, you know, I foreknew, I predestined to be children of God. What does it mean that God knew beforehand who would accept and reject him? Does that mean God plays favorites? Well, let's not talk about that. What about, what about people, really good people, who are suffering versus really bad people who seem to be prospering? It seems like God's unfair. We just kind of, ah, that can't be right, and we check it out, and we push it aside. And, we, and slowly over time, we stop following. We know people in our church family here, connected to our church family, who haven't been here in 25 years. What's interesting to me as a pastor, too, and I'm not saying this in a degrading way. It hurts my heart. I'm not saying it condemningly. When people who have not been in this church family for 25 years come across a, a terrible pain in their lives, they pick up the phone and they call the church. Or a loved one dies and they say, can you come? Yes, as we're able we will be there. But why do those people stay out for 25 years? Because they, like we sometimes, allow those questions to kind of fester and you know, kind of mold over and we just back up from the Lord. We don't dig in. And so when it gets hard, when these people were wrestling with this, they turned away and no longer went with him. They went away to follow their own thoughts. They went away to seek the counsel of the world. They went to live the world's way. Because yes, these things are hard. There are hard things about our faith, but at the core, it's very simple. Do you receive Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins or do you not? And it goes from there. So that's what he's saying. But many turned away and no longer accompanied him. Confusion, trials, pains, they, they do this to us. They cause us to, to think about this. Just a couple of quick verses. Jeremiah 15, 16, about following after the truth of God in Christ. Your words were found. I ate them. Your words became a delight to me, the joy of my heart, for I am called by your name, Yahweh God of hosts. So what God says to be true, we believe it. We eat it up. Do you have a hunger for God's word? Do you, do you feast on what he's saying is true? Or are you slurping up what the world says is true? Oh, you know, the church people are too demanding. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's all just a power game and this and that. And all roads lead to heaven or whatever it is. Are you, are you sort of slurping that up? Or are you feeding on what God says to be true? Psalm 119, 103, how sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Is what God says to be true what you say to be true? Or are you, again, walking the way of the world? When trials and confusions come, do you dig in and hold on to God's truth? And I know we all have slippery fingers sometimes. I'm not saying we have to do it perfectly. But, but do, we, do we hold on to and claim that truth and, and say, God, please help me? Help me continue to believe what I know to be true, even though it's windy and cloudy and dark and hard. Or do we turn and, and go a different way like these people did? Then he turns to the 12 in verse 67. You don't want to go away too, do you? There was something different going on here. There was a motivation that had been questioned, now wanted revealed, and now these people's motivation was affirmed. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered, Lord, who will we go to? Well, your mom or your aunt or your boss or, you know, People Magazine or the Internet or you could go to anybody, Peter. It's a little anachronistic, but you understand what I'm saying. 
Who would we go to, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. All of this is centered right in you, Lord. If I've received you as manna from heaven, if I'm banking my eternity on you, Lord, why in this moment of confusion about eating your flesh and drinking your blood, whatever that means, why would I go anywhere else? Lord, I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to keep following you. I'm going to keep seeking you. I'm going to keep growing in you. Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Verse 69, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And it's not this, this belief, this, and again, this eating the bread and all this, that's, that's a form of him saying, trust me, believe in me. But we have come to believe this. This is our truth. And this word right here, know that you are the Holy One of God. I've said this before, but there are two basic kinds of know in the, in, in the New Testament. One is kind of a propositional knowledge. It's the oida family of words. The, the other one is the gnosko family of words. It means knowledge by experience. Which one do you think this word is? It's the knowledge by experience word. It doesn't always work that way, but in this particular account, that's what it's saying. We have come to know by personal experience you are the Son of God. We just saw you walk on water yesterday. We just saw you feed 5,000. Lord, we know who you are. Why would we go anywhere else? But why do we go other places? Why do we accept other truths? Why do we eat other bread, so to speak? You have the words of life. True faith is not evidenced just by an affirmation of truth. Yes, there is a God. Yes, there is a Jesus. Yes, he died 2,000 years ago. Yes, he rose from the dead. That is historical fact, if you will. It's not just acknowledging and affirming that truth, it's accepting that as one's own. This is my truth. First John chapter two. This is how we are sure that we have come to know him. Every underline in this passage is the same gnosko word. This is how we know, how we're sure that we have come to know him by experience, by keeping his commands. How do we have our hearts set at ease before God that we're his children. We continue to rely on his truth, even when it's cloudy or foggy or difficult. The one who says, I have come to know him, yet doesn't keep his commands, isn't following after him, isn't accepting what he says to be true, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, obeys it, truly in him the love of God is perfected. We become mature. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. We should be little Jesuses with the same priority, the same compassion, the same forgiveness, the same boldness, the same lack of compromise, whatever. James 1.22 says it a little bit differently, as you recall. It says, don't just be hearers who deceive yourselves. Be doers of the word. You can't just acknowledge it. You have to rely on it. Walk as he walked. This is a word that means your manner of living. It, it, ha it means, and it's, in a, and it's in a tense that means it's your ongoing pattern of living. That you're, the pattern of your life looks like Jesus. And I, I fall short. I'm not saying we, we need to be perfect. That's not the point. We're imperfect. That's the point, and he's not. But the customary, overarching manner of our life would be accepting and relying on the truth of God. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? We started out with some different questions, but we've seen a motiva their motivation question, why are we following? Their motivation was revealed. They were following to get stuff materially, physically. And then the motivation being affirmed of, from, from Peter, maybe it's our heart this morning to who else would we go? And I pray that's your testimony, that you have the confidence of faith, not just 15, 20, 45 years ago faith, but today faith that is growing as your manner of living continues because there is nowhere else to go. And by the way, back to that awkward question that was prompted by the announcement about you know, services being combined and all that next week. Why? 
would the world, why would our families, why would people in our community and at our jobs accept a truth about Jesus that they don't see evidenced in our lives? That they don't see us walking out? That if we say that we believe in him and that we're walking as he walked, does our life look like we're walking as he walked? Are we patient and kind and tender and sacrificial? Are we forgiving people? Are we gracious and positive? Or are we negative, gossipy, you know, malcontents, complaining, whatever that is? Are we, are we blaming other people for, you know, well, you know, my Sunday school class is a mess, or this church is a mess, or my family's a mess, or this is a mess, or that's a mess, and shifting blame to everyone else. Look, at the end of the day, we are the ones responsible for how we respond to what's going on, and we individually, if we're God's child, are called to be the aroma of Christ. My job and major responsibility is me. Your major responsibility is you. You could always be my excuse for me not doing better, and I could always be your excuse for you not doing better, because we're not great, <laughs> right? But why would the world want something we say we believe, but we're not living out? So again, if we're walking after the Lord, if we're walking as he walked, if we receive this bread who came down from heaven in return, They'll see something in us, and then we won't be. This is my last thing, and then the worship team can come and help us during the invitation here. But then we won't be just religious people like Jesus saw in the first century. Do you remember what he said to the Pharisees? You're like whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but on the inside, dead man's bones. So quit the show. Quit pretending. Either accept me and follow after me or reject me and get out of my way. That's basically what he's telling us. You know, he's calling us, you know, and, and Peter, how could we not say, Lord, to whom else would we go? You alone have the words of life. If y'all would come up and help us. Uh, we're going to sing a pretty convicting song that a lot of us who are a little older know well. I surrender all. It's a, it's a pretty uh, get you where you live message in terms of uh, following after the Lord. So if you would, please stand. If you have any decision you'd like to announce to the church, joining the church, your desire to be baptized, anything you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. If you need a time of prayer, um, you're certainly welcome to. Or if you'd like to make public your decision this morning to receive Christ for your forgiveness and salvation, we would invite you to come forward as well.
Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, personally, I come before you somewhat convicted that we are what we eat. Lord, I thank you so much that you have, that you sent the bread of life. Lord, I pray that we, that's where we sup, Father, that he be something we feed on, that we internalize, Father, and that it nutri- gives us the nutrients that we need. Lord, that we become more like your son. Father, I also pray for those who that is not the case. Lord, that the world is where they sup. Lord, I ask that you would lay on them a burden that your son is in fact the bread of life. And Lord, I pray that we tell everyone where to get that bread. Lord, we love you. Be with us this week. Help us to be people changed by you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.